Glory and praise to the Lamb. What a time of worship we've had this morning. Wonderful. Isn't God good? Take your Bible, if you will, turn to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 14. We'll be reading verses 1 through 12. I'm going to try to be as quick as I can this morning. We've got other things going on in the service this morning. But we don't short God's Word. Amen? That is... That is the reason we're here, that's the reason we exist, and we depend upon God's Word for our substance in our life. So Matthew chapter 14, verses 1 through 12, if you have it, please stand together in reverence to the reading of God's Word. If you don't have your Bible with you, we'll have it on the screen. At that time, Herod, the Tetrarch, heard of the fame of Jesus, and said unto his servants, This is John the Baptist. He's risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. For Herod had laid hold on John, and bound him, and put him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife. For John said unto him, It is not lawful for thee to have her. And when he would have put him to death, he feared the multitude, because they counted him as a prophet. But when Herod's birthday was kept, the daughter of Herodias, danced before them and pleased Herod. Whereupon he promised with an oath to give her whatsoever she would ask. And she, being before instructed of her mother, said, Give me here John the Baptist's head in a charger. And the king was sorry. Nevertheless, for oath's sake, and them which sat with him at meat, he commanded it to be given her. And he sent... And he beheaded John in the prison. And his head was brought in a charger and given to the damsel, and she brought it to her mother. And his disciples came and took up the body and buried it and went and told Jesus. Heavenly Father, thank you that you've already met with us in a powerful, wonderful, moving way. Thank you that we can say glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain for us. Father, I ask you to please take your word this morning and make it new and fresh in our lives. And I ask it in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. In 1984, Avionica Airline, which is a Spanish airline, was flying from Barcelona to Madrid. It was a mountainous region across which they were flying, and Avionica Airlines was showing up on the control tower radar, but all of a sudden, the airplane disappeared. It had crashed into the mountainous region between Barcelona and its final destination there in Spain. 242 people lost their lives in the tragic accident. When National Transportation Safety Board inspectors showed up on the scene, they began to start going through the rubble, trying to figure out what happened, what took place in this horrible disaster that cost so many lives. Finally, they found the black box, the box that recorded all of the pilot conversation and the, the, the talk within the cockpit. The inspectors were shocked when they finally plugged in the black box and they got the black boxes to work. The first sound that they heard was a synthesized sound that was made by the electronics of the cockpit. And the voice in a synthesized tone started saying, pull up, pull up, pull up. That's a ground proximity warning that's given in the cockpit when the airplane is too low or when there's a terrain problem that would cause a likely crash. They listened to the synthesized voice say pull up, but then they were shocked, totally mesmerized, when the next voice they heard was the pilot's. And the captain said, shut up. And they heard a click. He had clicked off the ground proximity warning. Approximately one minute later, Avionica Airlines flew into the side of a mountain. 242 people perished because the pilot ignored the warning that he was given. I want to speak to you briefly this morning 
the death of our conscience. It's a terrible thing when a conscience is put to death. In that particular case, 242 people lost their lives because a warning was given, but it wasn't heeded. The warning wasn't taken seriously. You see, pilots hear warnings all the time in the cockpit. I can tell you as a ship's captain, we have all types of warnings that go on on the bridge. Some of those are bilge warnings and different warnings and different things can set them off. And in our experience, we somewhat know whether something is a serious warning and we need to pay attention and our experience tells us. But in actuality, we should pay attention to all of them. We should always heed the warnings that are given to us. We need to understand that our conscience was given to us by God. It's that ground proximity warning that keeps us where we need to be. And when we ignore our conscience, when we ignore the ground proximity warning that we're given, we're headed for chaos. We're headed for danger. Death can even lurk right around the corner when we don't heed our conscience, our ground proximity warning. The pilot of Avionica Airlines had a timely warning given to him. It demanded an immediate response. It was a very transparent warning because it was clear in nature. He needed to immediately pull up. But we find in that story as well, it was a terminal warning. Failure to heed that warning would result in death. But the pilot ignored it. To dismiss the warnings that were given in our life by God, the conscience that he's given us, can lead to death. It can lead to a delay in what he wants to do in our life. It can be a detriment. It can cause us to discard his word and his purpose for our life. It'll turn out into disaster. This is a tragic story about Avionica Airlines. But listen, this morning our text gives us a, a tragic story that's even more tragic in nature. John the Baptist was murdered. He was beheaded by Herod Antipas. Now, murder is bad in and of itself. But when you murder a good man, that's even worse. But let me tell you, when you murder someone and you murder a good man and you murder your conscience in the process, that is a tragedy. Yet it's a sad fact that you and I in our lives murder our conscience Daily. If we'll be honest with ourselves, our conscience speaks to us all the time. It's either telling us something we need to do, and we fail to do it, or it's telling us not to do something, and we do it. But the fact is, there's a still small voice in each one of us. That conscience is given to us as a guide. There are acts of commission, there are acts of omission. But this morning I want to share with you, there's also an act of demission. That act of demission, the word has its root in the word dismiss. It's easy for us sometimes when our conscience speaks to us, and it's not something that we want to hear, to just dismiss it. That's an act of demission. Those actions are an abdication, a disregard of the principles that God has put into our life in our conscience. There are warnings that we need to pay attention to. Brother Steve and I were visiting together, the, uh, I think the middle of the week, talking about the service today. And I shared with him a story that was so poignant to me, and I think it's, it's important that all of us keep in mind that when our conscience speaks to us, it's not always speaking to us about something bad. It's not always speaking to us about something we don't need to do. Many times our conscience is telling us we need to take action. There's something we need to do. My father was a pastor all of my life. And I remember a story that he shared with me one time, and it was poignant. And when I shared the story with Brother Steve, he kind of sat quietly on the phone for a minute. He said, Brother, that's brutal. I believe that was your exact word. My father shared with me that when he was a young man and he had just gotten out of seminary and he was trying to start a new church and he didn't have money and his, my mother and he were just barely, barely existing. 
They were doing all they could do to live. And he had gone to a fellowship meeting, and at that fellowship meeting, a missionary was there and shared a dream that God had given him and shared his call to the field. My father told me, he said, son, I had a hundred dollars in my pocket. He said, that was all your mother and I had. That was all we had to live on. That was all we had. We had nothing to eat. We barely could put gas in the car. And a hundred dollars was all we had. It might as well have been a million dollars at that point. And he said, God began to work on my heart and work on my spirit to give that hundred dollars to that missionary. And he said, I remember standing there and fighting with myself and questioning God and saying, Lord, you know this is all we got. You know we don't have anything else. And God did not let up. He continued to work on his heart to give that hundred dollars. And my dad shared with me, he said, son, I walked out of that fellowship meeting that night and I didn't give that hundred dollars. And he said, son, I want you to know I've regretted it all of my life. Because I'll never know what God would have done. I'll never know the power that he could take and multiply that hundred dollars and the countless souls that could have been reached. I'll never know the blessings that he had in store for me. Out of obedience, he had to wonder all of his life. Listen to me this morning. When your conscience speaks to you, when it tells you to do something, even when it tells you not to do something, there can be lifelong consequences. We need to be careful about dismissing that demission of our conscience because it can have lifelong effects. Brother Michael and I worked in a hospital together. And I can tell you in a hospital they work on a series of codes. Most people are not even aware of the codes. Sometimes they exist only in lights within the hospital. And certain colors of lights will light up, and those of us who are hospital staff know what that light means. It's, it's in essence a conscience reminder. We need to spring into action. There's something called a code blue. When a code blue is called in a hospital, that demands immediate attention. That means that someone is in cardiac arrest, and they are on death's doorstep, and everyone in the hospital needs to respond. And listen, failure to heed that warning can ultimately end in death and destruction. We're given warnings all throughout our life. And our conscience is that warning that God has built into each one of us. We're not born with a conscience. I want you to understand that. A conscience is a reflection of several things that take place in our life. We have the ability to conceive, but our conscience must be constructed in our life. Let's take a look at our conscience. How is our conscience constructed? How do we gain that ability that we need in our life to know what God wants us to do, what we should do, what we shouldn't do, what's right and what's wrong? I'll share with you this morning that our conscience is a reflection of our values. Values are a learned behavior. We are not born with value. Psalms 51.5 tells us, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. I'm a sinful creature. I was born into original sin. I wasn't born with the values that God wants me to have in my life, and I wasn't born with those characteristics of value that God wants me to apply in my life. How do I achieve these values? I think there's three things this morning we need to pay attention to. Listen to me, parents. We achieve values in our children paternally. They look to you and they look to me as guardians of value. This is no recent development. God ordered his people in Deuteronomy chapter 6. When he was talking about their children, he said, And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. Teach them diligently. We obtain the values that are going to lead our life 
and guard us from sin paternally. Parents, we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility not only to our children, but in Proverbs 22 it says, Train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old he shall not depart from it. But not only do we develop those values paternally, we develop them societally. You see, what we observe, we inevitably become. And whatever we conserve, we hold valuable to ourselves. I was told by a man of wisdom one time, John, it's impossible to soar with the eagles if you're going to insist on roosting with the turkeys. Yeah, it's true. Our society is wicked. It's wasteful. It's worthless. There's a degradation of morality in our society, a decay in spirituality, a demise of accountability between people. It destroys our conscience. Societal decadence leads to a mental despondence. And that leads to a death of our conscience. There's a warning for society. Matthew chapter 18 says, Woe unto the world because of its offenses. For it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man to whom the offense cometh. I'm reminded of the scripture that tells me clearly, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. We're in a society of political correctness, and public crudeness has become a norm. It dampens our conscience. Our values may be driven parentally, they may be derived societally, but also this morning, they must be discerned Scriptural. Our society was based upon the Word of God. Our founding fathers had a concept of God that they developed this country upon. They used the precepts, they used the concepts of the Word of God in the development of the freedom that we enjoy in this nation. And I want you to know this morning that when God's will and God's Word is discarded, He is always demoted. And when that happens, our conscience is demolished. Psalms 113 tells me clearly his word is a lamp unto my feet. It's a light unto my path. I must discern my values scripturally. If I don't discern those values in the light of God's word, I'm on the way to the death of my conscience. Without God's word, all of my works are worthless. I am sure to wonder. But our conscience may be a reflection of my value, but it's also a reflection of my virtue. Virtue. What is that word? What does it mean? When we talk about the word virtue, we're talking about integrity, morality, dignity. Listen to me. My virtues reflect my value. They're what people see. They're what makes a difference in life. They make a difference in my life, and they make a difference in the life that I touch. My virtues are important. They're an outward manifestation of an inward determination. And virtue is always visualized. Not too long ago, I preached you a message about thought. And we came to the understanding based on God's Word that thoughts are things. Thoughts are reality. God's Word tells us clearly, as a man thinketh, so is he. Our conscience develops where character meets virtue. Philippians 4.8 says, Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any what? Virtue. Virtue. Think on these things. My conscience reflects my value. It's directed by my virtue. But listen to me, it's imparted by my valor. Valor. 
my bravery, my courage, my fearlessness to take a stand for what's right in the face of everything that tells me it's wrong. To stand up on the Word of God. To stand up when my conscience tells me that I need to give that $100. And listen, that analogy was not about money. That was just a true story my dad shared with me. But it was so touching in my life because I've had to come to grips with a reality. You see, God's been really good to me. Really good to me. My wife and my sister are here this morning and they can tell you of times in my life that were dark. When I was away from God, when I couldn't seem to find Him, when my life was a wreck and was a mess, and spiritually I was a mess, and God is so good. He's so good to me. But you need to understand this morning that in the midst of all of that, I had ignored my I was raised with proper values. I should have had virtue. And I should have stood on valor. But I didn't. You see, I had a choice. And that choice took me down a wrong road. But praise God for His grace that brought me back to a right road. And instilled in me the desire and the drive to have that conscience renewed in me and to have a new life, and a new ability to serve Him. I need to have valor this morning, and you need to have valor. A life of conscience demands limitless courage from all of us. I have to have courage to stand, courage to speak, courage to seek, courage to sever, courage to sustain, and courage to separate myself. There is no victory without valor. We must have the bravery and the courage we need. In this text that we're talking about this morning, we're talking and looking at Herod Antipas and the death of his conscience that led to the destruction and the demise of John the Baptist. But Herod Antipas was a descendant. You see, we're talking this morning about the importance of those family values. Herod Antipas is a descendant of Herod the Great. And I want to show you this morning that the importance of our conscience and the, the building up of our values in our life and those virtues run along family lines and they have an importance in what we do in our family. You see, Herod the Great had nine wives. He systematically killed them when they made him unhappy, when they didn't please him, when they didn't do exactly what he wanted when he wanted. And it was Herod the Great that tried to kill Jesus when he was born. It was Herod the Great, the, the ancestor of Herod Antipas, that had ordered that the male children be killed in Bethlehem when Jesus was born. Herod Antipas was a, a drunken, depraved derelict. And he was in an adulterous relationship with his brother's wife, Herodias, the, the wife of his brother Philip. This man was morally bankrupt. He was mentally broken. And then, to go further, the son of Herod Antipas was Herod Agrippa. Remember that name? King Agrippa? He imprisoned Peter. He killed James. And he had a son, and his son's name was Herod Agrippa II. You might remember that name if you study God's Word, and you'll find that he put the Apostle Paul on trial. We see that our conscience, our values, our virtues, even our tendency to have valor are formed by patterns in our life that are parentally and societally and scripturally discerned. Herod's family tree is wicked. It's worldly. His conscience was cloaked in callousness. Herod Antipas. He's worried in this scripture. I want you to notice that. He's weary. Why is he worried and weary? Listen to me. His conscience is bothering him. When we read that passage of scripture, look at Matthew 14 too. Herod says, 
This is John the Baptist. He's risen from the dead. And mighty works show forth in him. Now Herod is worried because he had John killed. And he knew John was a good and a righteous man. And when he heard about Jesus and all the things that Jesus was doing, he was almost certain, this is John the Baptist and he's coming after me. Listen to me this morning. When we ignore our conscience, when we allow our conscience to be moved outside of the bounds of the values and the virtues that were set forth for us, and we don't have the valor to stand on them, we're always looking over our shoulder. We always have to be worried because we know we're guilty. We know that we deserve whatever's coming our way, and we have to live in a constant state of fear. It's not worth it, loved ones. Herod Antipas, in this passage of Scripture, is looking over his shoulder. He's worried. He also knew that everything he was doing was wrong. John the Baptist had already exposed his adultery. He had already espoused the proper law to him. And in result, he executed John. You know, Herod could kill his wives. He could execute prophets. He could embellish his flesh. But he could not escape his conscience. Loved ones on the Word of God, I want you to know this morning, neither can you or I. We can't escape it. Others may not see what we've done. Others may not know what we thought. Others may not have the ability to discern that we knew we should have done something that we did not know. But listen to it. We know it. We know it. And we'll carry that with us. Just like Herod Antipas is worried now. Because he knows he's guilty. I like the saying of a little boy one time that was asked about conscience. And he said, hey, conscience is what makes you tell your mom something before your sister does. Right? You know, there's two words we need to pay attention to. We can be conscious. That means we're aware of something. But our conscience sometimes makes us wish we were not aware of something. Pointing to others, we dull our conscience. Listen to me. Just like Herod and other people, sometimes we dull our conscience by pointing to others and pardoning ourselves. The tactic. Human beings seem to use it with great skill. Romans 2 verse 15 states, which show the work of the law written in their hearts. Listen, their conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts, the meanwhile, accusing or excusing another. We do that for our sake, not for somebody else. I read where the IRS has a conscience fund, believe it or not. A man one time sent $150 to the IRS and he included a, a little note. And the note said, I can't sleep at night. My conscience is bothering me. Here is a check for $150. And at the bottom of the note he wrote, and if I still can't sleep, I'll send you the rest. Listen, ignoring your conscience is like igniting a cannon. It'll devastate your life. It'll destroy your legacy. Three things quickly, and I need to be quick. Herod had a troubled conscience. Verses 3 and 4. Herod had laid hold on John and bound him and put him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife. For John said unto him, It wasn't lawful for you to have her. And when he would have put him to death, he feared the multitude because they counted him as a prophet. Herod had a troubled conscience, because of the message of God. John had exposed his sin. John said unto him, It's not lawful for you to do what you're doing with your brother's wife. He announced his adultery. He pronounced his anger. He told Herod the truth. Herod didn't like the truth. The world hates the truth. And if you love the truth, I want you to be prepared today the world will also hate you. 
It's told to us in God's Word. Who is the truth? Jesus said, I am the way, the what? The truth! He's the truth and the life. If we crave the truth, if our conscience covets the truth, if we continue to walk with the truth, we'll be castigated by the world. John 15 tells us, if the world hates you, just know it hated me before. Right? Amen. Herod was troubled because of the message of God, but he was also troubled by the man of God. In verse 5 he said he would have put him to death, but he feared the multitude. Because the multitude knew that John was a good man, and he knew that he was a godly man. Herod knew exactly who John represented and what John represented. And we're told clearly in Scripture that the death of his conscience led to the death of a righteous man. He ignored his conscience about John to impress his concubine. He listened to Herodias. That libeled Herod. He lost honor. Listen. Never, never, never substitute your conscience for the whims of others. God will speak clearly to you. Listen, young people. Don't fall prey to peer pressure. It's there. It's real. We deal with it every day. But do not allow peer pressure to be a substitute for the conscious value that your parents and that God have spoken into your life. So we find that, oh, Herod had a troubled conscience, but he also had a trapped conscience. In verse 6 through 9, we're told about the fact that Herodias' daughter danced a seductive dance. And it made Herod Antipas agree to something that he never wanted to agree to in the first place. Sin will always make us agree where we should disagree. It will always make us wonder when we should stand. It will always take us away from values. It will destroy our virtue. And it will leave us without valor and the ability to do what God has called us to do. And now Herod not only had a troubled conscience, but he has a trapped conscience. He sees no way out. He's boxed himself in. He accepted the seductive dance, and now he kills an innocent man. The death of your conscience is always the birth of disobedience, and it will always promise pestilence. Sin weaves a web, just like a spider. It's one strand at a time. What about the old saying, oh, what tangled webs we weave when first we practice to deceive? Herod had taken his brother's wife. He was warned by John. He observed the good, holy, righteous man that John was. He made a pact, a nasty pact with Herodias, and he fulfilled his lusty desire. The death of his conscience turned into a trap door. And it will always do that in your life and my life. Just like the Avionica Airlines pilot ignored the warning and it cost 242 people their death, Herod ignored multiple warnings, multiple opportunities to embrace righteousness, to eschew evil, to embrace all that was good, but one step by one step, one strand by one strand, one weaving of the web, one little subtle step after another. That's the way sin works. You see, if it ran in front of us and jumped in front of us like a banner, we'd be ah, awestruck by sin. It doesn't work that way. It subtly talks to us. It tells us this little thing is okay. You won't get caught. And even if you get caught, you can do this, and that little, that little penalty is not going to be much. And one little strand after another little strand, after another little strand. And before we know it, our conscience has been seared and we're in deep trouble. That's the way sin works. That's the subtle nature of Satan in our life. Oh, fear is the foundation of failure. It frightens us, it frustrates us, it makes us falter and faint. Herod cherishes his concubine more than he cares about his conscience. And look at what happens. 
The lust and the sensuality made him totally lose his senses. He had a troubled conscience. He had a trapped conscience. But lastly this morning, he had a tormented conscience. In verse 9 we read, And the king was sorry. Sorry. Some of us live in the world of sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sorry doesn't fix it. We need to avoid sorry. Herod Antipas was sorry. He knew he had done wrong. He knew he had violated his conscience. He knew the sin that he had committed, and he is sorry, but he's still in his guilty state. And then, along comes Jesus. We see Him in this story. You see, when we started out in our text this morning, we started with verse 1. Look at verse 1. And at that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard of the fame of Jesus. You see, Jesus will always remind us of our sin. Not only will He remind us of our sin, but only Jesus can redeem us from our sin. And Herod's conscience is twicked when Jesus comes on the scene. His mind becomes tormented. He has thoughts about vengeance that's going to take place. His dead conscience has led to a dark, that's where we'll always end up when there's a death of our conscience. The consequences of a dead conscience. Herod was wrong about the Savior and he had to wrestle with his sin. His mind was tormented. Killing our conscience always torments our character. Every time. It'll topple our composure. Listen, our consequences may be seen in the physical but they will always live in the psychological. We can't get it out of our mind. What is a picture that is burnt into our mind of our sin and of our consequences and of failing to listen to our conscience will live with us forever. We can dampen them. We can put a shade over them. But we can't do away with them. I can't outrun my mind Wherever I go, there I am. Amen? Titus chapter 1 says, Under the pure all things are pure, but under them that are defiled and unbelieving nothing is pure. Listen, even their mind and conscience is defiled. Herod was tormented because he beheld Jesus, but he didn't believe. Let me ask you this morning. Your conscience troubled? Is it trapped? Is it tormented? I'll be honest with you this morning. By not availing myself of the conscience that my family values put into me, that were led through the Word of God, by not letting Christ lead me through all of my life, I'll be honest with you this morning. There are some things in my mind I won't ever get away from. Jesus has put them under the blood. I'm forgiven. He's set me on a new ground. He's given me a new wonderful life. But I have to live with some of those things in my mind forever. I'm reminded of the psalmist David when he said, Oh my God, my God, my sin is ever before me. That was David, a man after God's own heart. Listen to me this morning. The death of a conscience can lead to the death of a soul. We need to protect our conscience. We need to protect our relationship with Jesus Christ. Young people, listen to me. Listen to me carefully. Glean those family values. Live those family values. Let them turn into virtue. And then have valor stand 
in the face of all difficulties, in the face of everything that you're led to, stand firm. And God will bless your life. You'll have a successful life. Let's stand together. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Let me ask you. There's got to be people here this morning that are haunted by hurt. Pounded by hurdles in their life. We've all dismissed our conscience from time to time. Those things are there. But I want you to know on the basis of God's Word, I want you to listen to me carefully. You can do something about that. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. He also said that He came to give me life, but not just life. He said, I came to give it to you abundantly. Abundant life. You're here this morning and you've seared your conscience. There's something there that's not quite right. You can make it right this morning. Jesus is here. He's the one that points it out and He's the one that fixes it. Without Him giving the fix, anything we do is lost. I remember the rich young ruler that came to Christ asking, what can I do to be saved? And Jesus said, sell all that you have and give it unto me, and come unto me and follow me. And the rich young ruler, according to Scripture, left sorrow. Because there was a conscience. And he knew that God was calling him. And he didn't respond. Let me, let me urge you this. If God is speaking to you, if He's touched your heart, if there's something there, respond to Him. Don't ignore your conscience. He's here. He's calling you and to me. Heavenly Father, we love You. Thank You for Your mercy and Your grace and everything You're doing in our life today. Move among us this morning. If there's one that doesn't know You, bring them to You. Father, if that hurt, that dismissal of conscience is there, give them the ability to move and to step into line with You and to grab a hold of You. And I ask it in Jesus' name.